Good morning and welcome to the Australian Human Rights Commission. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. We're here today to mark the release of the launch of our important report on sexual assault and sexual harassment in universities. But before we begin, I would like to introduce our incoming President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, Professor Rosalind Croucher, to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Kate Jenkins, and thank you all for coming to this very important occasion. It's, it's a rare one for me on my second day in the job to get an opportunity to front such an important piece of work. And of course, it's always about the work, and this work is a wonderful project. And like Commissioner Jenkins, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this beautiful land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge any Indigenous guests joining us today. Behind the, st the statistics in this report, which Commissioner Jenkins will share with you, are many personal stories, the experiences, deep experiences, deep pain. But it also, I think, reveals the opportunity for redemption. Interwoven in the report are also key elements of positive responses when people have been the subject of unwelcome sexual conduct and also sexual assault. Having strong formal pathways is, of course, a given. And universities and other public bodies are engaged in much reflection and much action here. And this report will continue that. But what I found interwoven into this report was the importance of support. Support from those in positions of responsibility, support to ensure pathways to the desired response, and fundamentally the support of those who are in the position of bystanders, friends, peers, and observers. This, I think, is part of the message of building respectful relationship, uh, respectful relationships. And there are great um, parallels here with the anti-bullying programs in schools, with the work in relation to family violence which um, I led two inquiries on the subject at the Australian Law Reform Commission. Building respectful relationships as part of the national plans to reduce violence against women. And it also, um, the building respectful relationships is also at the core of the work that, that I've just completed in relation to elder abuse, where attitudes to older people, the relationships, the intergenerational relationships, <coughs> lies at the heart of finding some of the solutions. Another element, I think, from the elder abuse work is that has a distinct parallel is in relation to formal reporting processes. And it's the measure of ensuring that the person who is at the, the heart of the issue remains at the centre and that they don't get lost in the loop in any response that is um, undertaken, both in terms of knowing what is happening, but also in terms of ensuring that their dignity as an individual is respected. But for many, whether it's in the context of family violence, elder abuse, or unwelcome sexual conduct, a formal response is often not what a person wants. This is not a new um, uh, revelation, but it is one that must work. So the formal reporting pathways are essential and are perhaps in a way the easiest to reform. The hardest things though, are to get at the culture that lies behind. And I found when I was reading the report, I kept asking, what do the women and men in this survey want? And there were echoes for me, I think, from the family violence work. They want to feel safe. They want to feel respected. And they want others to acknowledge the pain of their experience. 
They want others to support them in their healing. And they want things to change so others won't be subjected to what they were. And this means a change in culture. Changing culture is something that has a long horizon and happens incrementally. Understanding the difficulties and delicacies of sexual exploration at a time when young people are spreading their wings, both intellectually and personally. These are difficult journeys and there is so much to learn. Universities are in such a key position to help and support young people in those journeys and to support them when the lines are crossed into the unwelcome and indeed the unlawful zones. Residential colleges are places, as we saw in the report, where things can go wrong. But they are also places that, acknowledging a duty of care, they are places where supportive and responsive attitudes and actions in the context of changing student populations can be built. This is crucial to embedding cultural change on the front lines. For those of us who are from an older generation or two from the students who were surveyed in this report, I'm sure there are echoes of our own experiences as young men and women where we were exposed in, in ways to inappropriate sexual um, approaches. In those times, we managed as best we could. We got on with our lives and worked on our resilience strategies. But in my reflection, the thing, if I wanted something different in my own experience, I would say it's that bystander support. I would want others to step in and say, that's not on or back off, or let's go and do something else. The bystander response that's crucial in the anti-bullying manifests itself in older generations in the bystander response to support people who are being subjected to unwelcome sexual conduct. And I think that the extent to which bystanders support and intervene and support someone who is the target of such conduct is a measure of the effectiveness of that cultural change. And it's fundamentally about a shift in peer dynamics. It has a long horizon, but that to me is the target of success. The report is both an acknowledgement of the continuing problems for university students, but it's also a beginning. It's a, a report that, that has significant involvement. It is the project of encouragement, support and, and input from the university sector itself, students and um, university management. It is a beginning. It's a beginning to heal, to support and to ensure that students are safe. And where reports of sexual harassment or sexual assault are made, that they are responded to appropriately and lessons are learned to build a caring, respectful culture for future generations. Thank you to the support for the project. Thank you to Commissioner Kate Jenkins and her team for the work on this very important project. It's clearly been a huge effort and commitment of all involved. And for all of those who shared their stories, their experiences with the team and contributed to the survey, thank you for your candid uh, commitment, your candid sharing and the privilege of being involved in a process that I hope, I believe, will make a difference for future generations. So now it's over to you, Commissioner Jenkins, to talk about the detail of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind, and I look forward to working on these issues with you as you go forward with your presidency. So I'm pleased to launch the Change the Course National Report on Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment at Australia's Universities. The report marks a huge milestone. 
For decades, university students and advocates and survivors of sexual harassment and sexual assault have argued for change. We've all heard stories of behaviours occurring on campus. And today, for the first time, we have statistically significant national data on the prevalence and nature of this problem at Australia's universities. The Change the Course report is based on the National University Student Survey, which was conducted last year by the Australian Human Rights Commission. The survey examined the prevalence, nature and reporting of sexual assault and sexual harassment at Australian universities and was completed by more than 30,000 Australian students. Our report also includes powerful stories and quotes from written submissions we received. And we received 1,849 submissions, which for the Commission is the most number of submissions we've ever received for a single piece of work, which I think reflects the magnitude of the issue, but also the appetite for change. Many university students are young people who are maturing into adulthood, often living away from home for the first time, seeking new friends and new experiences at university. University is a formative experience and many of these students will become Australia's leaders. So it's confronting to learn that sexual assault and sexual harassment are a common part of these students' experience in their academic, their social and their residential life. Sadly, the impacts of these experiences have um, devastating impact and it can be life-changing, affecting health, studies and future careers. The Change the Course reports, report tells a clear but disturbing story and that's a story we want to change. We have known for a long time that sexual assault and sexual harassment occur far too frequently in Australian workplaces. The findings of our research make it clear that this is also the case at our universities. So let's start by looking at the facts. Overall, one in five students was sexually harassed at, Australia, at Australian University last year. 1.6% of students were sexually assaulted in a university setting in 2015 and 2016. To put this in context, in a lecture theatre containing 100 students, at least one and possibly two students have been sexually assaulted in the past year, sorry, the past two years. And 21 of those students will have been sexually harassed in the past year. In 2016, women were almost twice as likely as men to have been sexually harassed in a university setting. <coughs> the survey found that 32% of women and 17% of men had been sexually harassed in a university setting in 2016. Women were more than three times as likely as men to have been sexually assaulted in a university setting in 2015 or 2016. Our survey also collected the first national prevalence data on sexual assault and sexual harassment experienced by trans and gender diverse students. And it found that they were more likely than either men or women to have been sexually harassed in a university setting in 2016. We also found that students who identified as bisexual, gay, lesbian and homosexual reported higher rates of these behaviours than those who identified as heterosexual. A large number of students who were sexually assaulted and sexually harassed at university in 2015 or 2016 said the perpetrator was a fellow student. This was something recounted to us in submissions. We received numerous accounts of women being sexually assaulted by people they described as close friends who they trusted. The impacts of being assaulted by a friend from university were often severe. In submissions, people described feeling anxious about being on campus because they were afraid of seeing the perpetrator. In some cases, the fear was so great that the students dropped out of university altogether. While most perpetrators were fellow students, we heard of a devastating breach of trust when students were harassed by teachers or staff. That was most likely to happen to postgraduate students. 
The survey results showed us that sexual assault and sexual harassment occurring in varying degrees across all university settings. The most common settings where the most recent incidents of sexual harassment occurred were public transport to or from university, campus grounds and teaching spaces. One woman told us in her submission of ongoing sexual harass which she experienced from a university lecturer who took the same bus to campus as she did. Over a period of several months, he made her feel more and more uncomfortable. One day, he put his arm around her and he kissed her cheek. From then on, she arranged for her sister to call her every day when she travelled on the bus so she could avoid talking to the lecturer. A number of submissions we received reported unwanted physical contact in the middle of classes. A female student told us about her classmate exposing his genitals during her lecture. Another woman was groped by a classmate. In relation to sexual assault, the National Survey results found that the most recent incidents most commonly occurred at university or resident social events, residential colleges or on public transport. We also received a number of submissions from people describing incidents of sexual assault which occurred on an O-Week camp. These camps were organised by student clubs and societies to introduce first year students to university life. A woman told us she was raped by a senior student leader who was running one of those camps. She later heard that he had previously raped other female students at these camps and no action had been taken. A large number of submissions described alcohol as a factor contributing to the experience of sexual harassment and sexual assault, both at university social events and within residential colleges. One woman went on a night out with friends from college. A male friend bought her drinks all night and encouraged her to drink. When she began to feel unwell, he offered to take her back to her college dorm room, but instead he took her to his room. She passed out on the bed and woke up to find her friend sexually assaulting her. Sadly, this was an experience we heard again and again. We also heard about hazing and other college traditions. And these have been widely documented in the media. The fact that these behaviours continue to exist in colleges and that they involve sexual assault and sexual harassment of students um, who in some cases are in their first week or even their first day in college is deeply concerning. Perhaps most worryingly, there was a perception that colleges were aware of these behaviours and did nothing to prevent them. You had to participate. There was nothing you could do about it. The administration knew about this and they condoned this. The students had no power whatsoever. You couldn't say anything, one student told us. The majority of students had little or no knowledge of how to make a formal report or complaint. We found that only 2% of people who were sexually harassed and 9% of those who were sexually assaulted at university made a formal report or complaint to their university. This aligns with the low rates of reporting of sexual assault and sexual harassment in the broader Australian community. The Commission heard about the barriers people face to reporting sexual assault and sexual harassment. One of the most common reasons for not reporting was that people did not know where to go or who to report to. So it's clear that universities must do more to publicise their reporting processes. We also heard from people who had to wait weeks to access counselling services or who were denied special consideration when they were unable to study for exams due to the trauma experienced from sexual assault. A common barrier to reporting was a feeling of shame uh, or self-blame about what had happened. And when individuals did report, we heard the person that they told sometimes reinforce those feelings. One woman who reported her sexual assault to her college was asked about her drinking habits and what she would do in the future to make sure this didn't happen again. Another woman who experienced ongoing sexual harassment by a fellow student reported the behaviour to her supervisor who told her to take it as a compliment. 
A man who was sexually assaulted said he did not report to his university because male victims of sexual assault are not taken seriously. A student who was raped by a member of her university sporting club reported her sexual assault to the university, who breached her confidentiality by telling the club. As a result, she was ostracised from the club and lost her friends. These examples make it clear that attitudinal change and greater awareness is needed not only among university students, but also university staff who receive reports of these behaviours. Change the Course confirms that universities must do more to ensure that everyone has access to a safe university education. On the current enrolment numbers, university students make up 5% of the Australian population. Given the size of the university community, taking action to address sexual assault and sexual harassment will not only have a positive impact on universities, but also has the potential to affect change in the Australian community more broadly, where we know sexual assault and sexual harassment rates are also unacceptable. Our report makes a total of nine recommendations aimed at better preventing and responding to sexual assault and sexual harassment. These recommendations cover five key areas. The first is leadership and governance. There needs to be a strong and visible commitment to action from university leaders and better engagement with the students, accompanied by clear and transparent implementation of these recommendations. Secondly, we're calling on universities to undertake targeted education and campaigns aimed at changing attitudes and behaviours. Third, we urge universities to improve their responses to sexual assault and sexual harassment, including ensuring that students have access to specialist support. Fourth, the report recom recommends monitoring and evaluation of the measures taken to ensure that they are evidence-based and that improvements are made over time. And finally, in relation to colleges, we've re recommended an independent expert-led review to identify measures to address the high prevalence rate of sexual assault and sexual harassment in this setting. I'd like to thank the 39 universities, Universities Australia, the National Union of Students, the Hunting Ground Australia Project, the Australian Human Rights Centre at the University of New South Wales, who will launch their good practice report on this topic this Thursday, and NRAPE on campus for their involvement in this work. I'd also like to thank our team at the Australian Human Rights Commission for their hard work and dedication to this project. Most importantly, I'd like to thank the students and the advocates who made submissions or completed our surveys. Without your contributions, this report would not have been possible. In particular, to all the survivors of sexual assault and sexual harassment who participated in this work, I want you to know that your voices have been heard. And I commend you for your bravery in coming forward with these deeply personal accounts. This report is comprehensive and evidence-based. It provides detailed information on the scale and the nature of the issue, which affects a significant proportion of the Australian community. It's clear that students at our universities are experiencing unacceptable rates of sexual assault and sexual harassment. No one can read the stories without being deeply affected. We must work together to change the course to ensure that sexual assault and sexual harassment have no place in Australian universities. Students have done their part and universities now owe them swift, swift action to address these issues. It cannot wait. I'd, thank you. I'd like to now introduce and call on um, the President and Vice-Chancellor of Monash University and the Chair of Universities Australia, Professor Margaret Gardner AO, to respond on behalf of the higher education sector. President Croucher, Commissioner Jenkins, President Johnston, let me also begin by acknowledging that we meet here on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. 
Today, I speak on behalf of university leaders across Australia. We began the Respect Now Always campaign over a year ago to respond to calls to more actively combat sexual assault and sexual harassment in universities and to build a safer and more respectful community at large. At our request, the Australian Human Rights Commission surveyed our students so that we could better understand what we needed to do. Thousands of students, over 30,000 students answered. And I want to thank all of them for responding. You shared your experiences. Some of you shared stories of significant personal trauma and pain. So before I say anything else today, I want to speak directly to the survivors of sexual assault in student communities. To each of you, I say this. We are sorry that this happened to you. Sexual assault is a crime. The person who sexually assaulted you had no right to do what they did. It is not your fault. But through your stories, you call on us and on every fellow student and member of staff to do more to prevent others from ever experiencing the damage and the shattering of confidence and trust that's inflicted by the person who assaulted you. We cannot take away the pain you have felt or that you feel, but we can acknowledge it. And we can respond to that pain with compassion and care. It has taken real courage to tell your stories and we thank you for telling us what has happened to you. We are listening and we will act. We are determined to lead further change in our university student communities and in our society. We want to work with our students and staff to demand respectful and responsible behaviour in university communities and in the wider society. We want universities to be places that work actively and strongly to prevent sexual assault and sexual harassment. And each of us has a role in this. Students, staff and university leaders together are crucial to preventing sexual assault and sexual harassment. We also urge all in our community to report criminal or unacceptable behaviour. By making reporting more likely, by reporting more, we will ensure that these behaviours are less likely. Our universities must be places of safety and respect. This report, released by the Australian Human Rights Commission today, demands our careful attention. Leaders from all 39 universities ask the Commission to gather this information from our students because we wanted to know what is happening to them on our campuses and beyond them. So we could act informed by evidence. We are making public not only the national results, but also our individual university data from this survey today. We ask that the findings of all reports be used sensitively in a way that is mindful of the impact of this information on survivors. We pledge to share these reports with our university communities because this is our guide to further action. So around Australia today, university leaders are meeting with students and staff. On every campus, they are meeting with students and staff to discuss the information from these surveys with them. We will, of course, analyse this report in greater depth in coming days and weeks. But we already know this, that much more is needed to be done. 
Over the past year, while the Commission was undertaking this research, universities have had conversations with survivors, with students, with sexual violence prevention experts and counsellors. And today, we, 39 universities, commit to a 10-point action plan to respond strongly and swiftly to these findings. This 10-point action plan is a set of major initiatives that our 39 universities together, through our peak body, Universities Australia, will undertake and fund as part of the Respect Now Always campaign. The first of these major commitments was announced last week. It is a new interim around the clock specialist support line for student victims and survivors. We know that for some today will be very difficult as they recall past trauma. If any student watching today needs help or support, the specialist trauma counsellors who staff this line can be reached on 1800 572 224. That's 1800 572 224. We also commit to lead a new important prevention initiative. Research by Our Watch shows that more needs to be done to embed respectful relationships education at primary and secondary school level. We will build on those efforts at a university level. We will develop a respectful relationships program specifically tailored for university students. It will be one that is best practice because it is evidence-based. It will build on existing initiatives already in place at a number of universities. First responder training will also be made available more broadly across our universities to equip more staff and students with the skills to respond appropriately when a survivor discloses. New first of their kind training modules are being designed for university leadership and staff in awareness and prevention of <coughs> sexual assault and sexual harassment. And a new specialist training module for university counsellors will enhance and extend the skills of our mental health clinicians to provide support for people affected by sexual harassment and sexual assault. We've also begun work on developing a set of best practice university policy guidelines for reporting and dealing with misconduct. They will help to inform the review and development of sexual assault and sexual harassment guidelines across our sector. We are also working with our colleagues at the National Tertiary Education Union and the Council of Australian Postgraduate Associations to develop principles on interactions between supervisors and postgraduate research students. This 10 point action plan heralds an important set of major initiatives to which we have committed. But these are the university sector wide initiatives. Today, on campuses across Australia, university leaders are briefing their students and staff on the results of the survey, and they are working with them on new and renewed local initiatives to prevent sexual assault and sexual harassment. As they do, I want to pay tribute to every single person who has helped inspire and create improvements for the better over the past decade and what I know will be the great efforts for the future. To defeat sexual assault and sexual harassment, university leaders from right across the country stand, stand united with their students and staff today and reflecting that, National Union of Students President Sophie Johnston, Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins and I are here as one today in our shared resolve. Let me be clear. Sexual assault is a crime and sexual harassment is never okay. We are united and we stand united in our determination to prevent them.
Thank you, Margaret. And I'd now like to invite up to the podium Sophie Johnston, who is the President of the National Union of Students, to provide her comments on the report. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. As President of the National Union of Students and a survivor of sexual assault, I feel the immense responsibility to represent the voices of so many students and survivors in a conversation that is terribly overdue. I want to recognise all of the victims and survivors who have never been afforded justice. Those who have suffered in isolation because of our failures to have an open and honest conversation. For 30 years, student unions and women's officers have been fighting for recognition of the issue and the solutions in changing this culture. In 2015, the NUS talk about its survey brought to life the seriousness and depth of this issue. And today, on a much larger scale, the severity of gendered violence has once again been confirmed to us. We have no other choice but to face this head on. For too long, victims have been deterred from speaking out because of vague reporting systems and a failure to educate our communities on consent. We have failed to provide victims with the support they deserve. And in doing so, we have silenced so many individuals and denied them recognition of their trauma. It is much easier to focus on the successes of an institution rather than its failures. However, it is honourable to acknowledge that we have failed, but that you refuse to continue to fail on this issue. And that will be one of the, one of the biggest challenges facing universities today. One of the biggest barriers in combating this culture is the difficulty in starting the conversation. It is never easy to talk about sexual assault or gendered violence, and it's harder to talk about rape when it's happening in our own institutions. This is why before 2016, Australian universities generally didn't have standalone policies on sexual violence. We deterred so many people from speaking out because we were terrified of a conversation that could not be controlled or curated. Or worse, because we pretended it was a problem affecting someone else and not us. Gendered violence and sexual assault have been an unspoken experience in our society for many years. It is not just a university problem, a college problem, or an individual problem. This is a cultural battle being faced everywhere. We need to recognise how the integrated and very diverse communities within our universities do create an environment where these behaviours and attitudes can easily manifest. The fact that so many victims were in their first few years of study speaks to a power dynamic and peer pressure that could have been prevented through education. It broke my heart when I read this report, not because I expected the results to be any less severe, but because after decades of silence to finally see the raw data and to hear the trauma of so many individuals is incredibly confronting. And it will be confronting for universities to address these findings. As universities analyse their own campus specific data, it is crucial they do so accepting their vulnerability. Vice chancellors need to remember that while this is a difficult conversation to have, this process has been far more traumatic and confronting for the countless individuals, particularly women, who have had no choice but to live with the trauma of sexual violence. Students will not accept a race to the bottom. As universities, sorry, and, and they will not accept hearing universities congratulating themselves on being slightly below the national averages. Every single rape and sexual assault is a tragedy. There is no celebration or congratulations to be had. There is nothing to revel in in having a few less sexual assaults than the university next door. Every university has an equal responsibility to tackle this. I was reflecting on this last night and what I said when I was elected into this position as president representing over 1 million students across Australia. It is an immense responsibility and privilege for me to be standing here and speaking on behalf of so many students and survivors. I will never take for granted that responsibility and the obligation I have to be candid and honest about the failings that I see in front of me. 
I urge universities to embrace the recommendations made by the Human Rights Commission and subsequent recommendations that will be made by the Australian Human Rights Centre. We need best practice report structures so that victims no longer remain silenced. We need standalone help services that provide victims with immediate support and advice. But we also have a responsibility to educate our community, to take control of this crisis and to prevent further victims from going through this awful experience. It is shocking to see that 40% of those who experienced sexual assault didn't report because they felt that it wasn't bad enough. We're told that sexual violence is a stranger who jumps out of the bushes and attacks you, not your classmate or a supposed friend. No victim should ever feel they do not deserve justice or support. If you are someone out there who has been sexually assaulted, there is no scale on this violence and you deserve to feel loved and supported. Universities see themselves as frontiers of new ideas and progress in this country. This survey is an opportunity to be an example to societal institutions, to acknowledge past failures and to finally take action. Any West will be fearless and brave in calling out universities who fail, but we are here to work hand in hand if you want to change the culture together. I urge universities to ensure students and survivors are at the forefront of the responses going forward. Today is the beginning of a very long road, but I hope the release of this report will truly lead us to combat this culture, not just in, within universities, but across the nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. That was a fantastic, eloquent way to describe where we're at. And I acknowledge your personal experience as well. Now, I'll take this opportunity to invite Margaret back to um, the front with us. The three of us here are now open to take questions. So if um, the journalist asking the question would indicate who you want to answer the question, that would assist. Thank you. Or not. Um it's a a great question. Uh, the reality is we don't have comparable data. Uh, so the the comparisons or the research in Australia on these topics. Um, include the Australian Human Rights Commission Sexual Harassment Prevalence Survey, uh, which looks at the experience. It covers a five-year period, so that tells us that 25% of women and 16% of men in the, have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace in the last five years. Uh, the Personal Safety Survey run by the ABS is the one that looks at the experience of sexual assault. Again, it's hard to get a comparable number, uh, but the observation in that survey is that um, uh, particularly young people that age bracket of 18 to 24 in our community experience both men and women a much higher rate of sexual assault. So in terms of the answer to that question, there's actually not a clear answer, uh, but my response is this uh, report tells us that it is a concern in rate and that actually uh, it might be comparable to the broader community, but that is also an incredibly concerning rate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, so essentially th this problem starts very early on from primary school throughout high school where the sexual education that we actually receive doesn't go into uh, consent training and gendered violence and understanding respect for relationships and those sorts of things. So one of um, 
the things that the, the federal government needs to take action on is actually ensuring that uh, younger Australians are actually receiving um, this training very early on. Um, but again, universities also have their responsibility to uphold it. Um, you know, like I said, universities have a very integrated community. Um, easily um, an easy environment for these issues to manifest so they do have a responsibility to continue that consent training but yeah I, I do believe that we really need to start um, this education early on that's great Gemma then there and then there to all of these the universities have a responsibility to warn parents you I'll start with that. Look, I think this report will raise concern for parents as well as students. Um, I think that uh, you would want to ask questions, uh, but my view is we now have this report. We have a commitment and an interest for change. So it it is a reason to think that things might get better. And I would add to that, that we know from this report that a lot of students do not experience these behaviours. So it is not uh, every person's experience. It is unacceptable that those experiences happen to any student in any setting. Um, when we talk about residential colleges, of course there are residential colleges that are not in the control of the university, there are residential halls that are in control of the university and of course there are outside private providers. Certainly with the residential colleges, we have been talking to um, the, the Union of College Associations and they are expressing great um, interest in working with us in the universities and with Universities Australia about implementing um, the sorts of programs that will improve prevention. And we have extended our hand to say to all those um, areas where we, we have no control over the, um, the place where the student stays, that we are happy to talk with people and to provide them with uh, access to the sort of expertise we have. Our intention is that we should provide a safe and respectful place for students no matter where they live and so we are willing to work as cooperatively as we can with residential colleges about better prevention. Okay, I'm, I'm just going red jacket and then over there and then Nina. Um, the university is responsible for being um, particularly well received by um, by by some activist groups, in particular and Ray Hong Campus, who um, one of their representatives, Sharon Bramlett, has responded to what you said this morning by saying that universities have been complicit in harm and that they're now taking credit for the work of survivors, but she is absolutely devastated that someone as a member of the had 13 months that she worked for group to see VCs and unions taking credit for their work. Um, but today, universities continue to refuse to accept responsibility for their complicity. How, does, how do you respond to that? I would reiterate what I said. We are very sorry for what has happened to people who have been, who are victims or survivors of sexual assault. It is unacceptable. We are committed to taking action to ensure that we can better prevent sexual assault and sexual harassment on our campuses and that we can provide better support to students who may have been the victim or survivor of sexual assault or sexual harassment. And that is our commitment today and that is a commitment from all 39 universities. There are things that have happened that are not acceptable and we recognise that. We commissioned this work and we have looked and talked with people in order to find in more detail what we need to do to act effectively. And our commitment here today is that we have been listening to what has been said, we are prepared to act and we are we are we have a 10 point action plan to begin that action and to begin that conversation with students and staff across our campuses. Yep. 
So we, we use the definition of sexual harassment in the Sex Discrimination Act. So sexual harassment is unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature where the person receiving the conduct would reasonably be offended, humiliated or intimidated. The way we ask the question to students though is when you give that technical question, students uh, and actually respondents in our broader work on sexual harassment uh, don't think immediately what those behaviours would be. So in the survey we described 14 different behaviours that would constitute unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature and that included physical touching, it included comments, it included innuendo and it, different sort of behaviours. So the, the questions really asked about the behaviours. Thank you. Nina. Um, I've got a question about Yeah. So can I just add, um, if I didn't use the word perpetrator, I definitely was talking about them. Um, but the report does have a whole chapter on perpetrators and it was really clear both in the data and in the submissions that students are really concerned that perpetrators are not held to account. So why don't I hand that over to Margaret. Um, Yes, the, the call for greater reporting is both a call for greater reporting so we are able to take action against perpetrators because we need reports for that, to enable that action. But one of the actions in the action plan is actually these best practice policy guidelines which are actually going to how um, misconduct is actual misconduct processes and policies are actually shaped in universities. And so that is one of the commitments of Universities Australia and that work has begun. And that has begun a conversation with the universities about the processes, the misconduct processes they have and how they might be made more effective. Uh, so that is, uh, that is definitely a commitment and one I made in the speech. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So that question relates to the fact that um, the sexual assault sections of the survey asked for people to disclose if they had uh, had experienced sexual assault and then went on to explore the settings. Um, the reason we had asked the question in that way was that the advice we received at that time was that it might be more harmful to ask the same detailed questions of survivors of sexual assault. Uh, this, uh, we have obviously a long history of doing surveys in sexual harassment, but a survey of this magnitude covering both areas had not been conducted before. Uh, so we have done the survey. The survey showed significant experiences of sexual assault. Uh, we also asked for an independent person to review to make sure that our process and methodology was effective and it didn't result in under or over reporting. And the review showed us that um, the, the, particularly for women, the um, the survey results were accurate. Uh, that being said, uh, we would always look forward to assess whether we could do this in a more effective way. And we have absolutely most definitely heard students raise a concern that that might not have been the best way to do the survey. Thank you. Is 
So uh, I'll start with that. This report is, the value of it is the really minute and detail and factual nature of the results. Uh, so the report does get a much better sense of what are the factors at play. And uh, we don't uh, use terminology about culture in that way, uh, but the survey showed us that there are a number of things that were present that were pretty consistent in some of the situations that arose. And the sorts of things that were present were concerning attitudes about gender and sex held by um, people in the university population and potentially across the broader community. There was presence of alcohol in a number of situations um, involving sexual harassment, and sexual assault. There was perpetrator power, so not simply just um, lecturers, but actually older students taking advantage or residential advisors in colleges. So older students in positions of power over more junior students. And the last factor that was present was proximity. So the idea that if you're at a party or near a bedroom in a residential college, there's an ability to isolate uh, students and it, it in that situation. So those were the factors that our report told us were present and they are some of the factors that we've particularly pointed residential colleges to look at more closely. Um, yeah, I, I think that the severity of the problem really, really comes out in this report. You can't dispel um, the seriousness of this issue. Um, I think it's been made pretty clear. But what's important or another important factor that's come out is, is these attitudes that Kate um, mentioned about how, um, for example, women are perceived and how um, looks and, and different gender um, makes uh, turn the blame towards the victim and um, uh, away from the perpetrator so that the victim is seen as, you know, asking for it or all these, um, you know, terrible cultural um, attitudes that really um, are, are brought to life in the survey but hopefully um, can be combated. Um, so we know that one of the problems for you is making sure that there's a conviction in the case of a sexual assault before you can actually make real decisions. Would universities consider withdrawing conferred degrees uh, in the of uh, convictions that happen after graduation? That is an issue that, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't been fully debated across the university community. Universities, as you know, have different regulations and statutes about conferring of degrees. I think that raising that issue is one that we will have to consider as we look at the as we look at this review of guidelines um, in relation to misconduct. I have a question for Professor Gardner. You mentioned the need for special services at universities. I note that um, as of this moment or until recently, some units didn't even have specific phone lines for assault um, survivors to call. So what, what's the timeline for implementing special services and um, why haven't they been implemented? So yes, universities obviously have different levels of support available in part because they have different levels of resource available to them. Uh, the specialist support line that is being run through Universities Australia is available to all students and that is available now. That number, I quoted 1800 572 224, that is available, that is funded, that is in place. And universities, as they are responding to the recommendations from the Human Rights Commission in this report and as the work flows out in terms of the, the 10 point action plan that Universities Australia has put in place, we'll be looking at the nature of their services and what they provide in the future. I'd like to turn the attention to international students. So there's mention here that domestic students were more likely than international students to be sexually harassed. That seems at odds with what activist groups have been saying for years. So I'd like to ask what efforts were made to make sure that international students felt that their, their thoughts were welcomed in this research and also that there were no language barriers or anything preventing them from coming forward with their 
Yes, thank you. So when we um, conducted the survey, we used a sample methodology. So more than 30,000 students responded. In doing that, we made sure that there was a representation on four criteria. One of them was whether they were domestic or international students, which is why you have that data. The others were between men and women, um, continuing or commencing students and postgrad and graduate. So when we conducted the survey um, and to make sure we had statistically useful information, we made sure that we did have a representative. So in terms of the statistics, the data is reliable. We know that there were a, a significant number of students who responded, so we can use that information. If we didn't get a sufficient response, we couldn't have provided that data. In terms of what the findings were, so I think some of the findings in the report are uh, perhaps not what was expected. We've had conversations in some ways, it's very much what we expected knowing the broader Australian community. Uh, but for international students, while it did um, identify that it was a slightly lower rate, it was still concerning that it happens. And our reporting systems did indicate that international students can have more difficulty accessing the reporting systems, which might reflect that um, greater difficulty in getting into the system. Yeah. No, the survey wasn't available in different languages. Yeah. We have time for one question. Oh, I'm Professor Gardner. Do universities have a clear idea about where their duty of care sort of extends and where it ends with respect to this issue? So universities have at their core an interest in the safety uh, and security of their students. Obviously, we have greater control over the settings that are university settings. But we also have an interest in supporting those students. Those, we want those students to have the great education that they want. So if they are sexually assaulted outside a campus in a setting over which we have no control or sexually harassed somewhere that is not related to the university. We still have an interest in supporting those students because we want them to be able to, to have that great educational experience. So while we can't control what happens in settings outside our, outside the things that are university settings, we actually have a deep duty of care to support our students so that they are able to access the sort of educational experience that we, we really wish them to have. And beyond that, we have a responsibility that we educate our students so that when they go out into the world, that they are taking with them the sort of values about respectful and responsible relationships that make a difference to the community at large. So yes, there are things we can control, but our interest in education is a broad interest. And it means that it means support for students to have that great education experience. You want those students to leave and to have looked back and said, they, they were the golden years. And that's our responsibility. And then you want them to go forth and take the values that you think are most important for the society and to take them out and to make a difference in the wider society. Thank you very much for attending today. And I'll invite you to join us for morning tea. Thank you.